Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage our chair for the next session, Sir David Pearson. Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome to this afternoon session. I think we've got a fantastic array of speakers uh, lined up for you and to discuss this important topic of data. And part of my history was uh, as a director of adult social care, but also a chair of an integrated care system, and more recently working in government on leading the social care task force on COVID-19 for social care. And my three or four observations from that is that um, the importance of data and information to inform what we're doing cannot be underestimated. And in the integrated care system in Nottinghamshire, we developed a joint records and information system um, which pulled together records from health and social care could be pseudonymized and had over 200 algorithms to understand who was at greatest risk tomorrow and how health and care services could intervene to support people to um, prevent the next worst outcome. Thinking about the pandemic in responding to something as critical as COVID-19, we experienced a, co a, a, a paucity of data in order to inform what support the social care sector should have, how and where, which then had to be developed very quickly. And then the other bit of this is about making sure that people who have services are in control of their own data, because knowledge and information for people who use services is part of putting people into, in control. So how do we put people in control and ensure that they can use that to manage their own support and care needs as far as people are able to, um, that we are anticipating people's needs to provide that person-centred coordinated care and that we are operating as a whole system to make sure the case and the investment and the resources and the capacity are available in social care. Just a few thoughts to start you with. But I wanted to uh, next introduce Lord Victor Adebowale, who's the CBE, who's also the chair of uh, NHS Confederation, uh, to set the scene for us this afternoon. Victor, thank you. Wow, well, can everybody hear me okay? okay good. Um, I always... Um, I wonder about why I get asked to do these speeches, and now I know why. Um, it's because, A, I'm cheap, actually free, <laughs> and secondly, it's very difficult to get someone to do the after-lunch slot. <laughs> so here I am, and I always say, um, by way of introduction, that I think I'm amongst friends, um, so please, people wonder about the titles and what they should refer to me as. So as I'm amongst friends, you can refer to me as um, Professor the Lord Victor Adibawali, <laughs> CBE. Um, okay, so that's proven that you're all awake and that those of you that have gone shopping will miss something. Um, so I'm going to give you a position statement from someone who I'm not a technologist, okay? I'm not a technologist. Um, I've got A-levels, but I'm sure there are people in this room that have got better A-levels than me and know about all sorts of codings and can speak a language that generally I only listen to when I watch Star Trek. But I have been a member of the House of Lords for 20 odd years, crossbench peer, not a member of a political party. I get to slag them all off. I have been on the chair of, I have been on the board of NHS England for six years. I am, as, a, as accused, the chair of the largest representative body of healthcare leaders in the UK, but I'm also the chair of the founding chair, co-founding chair of a company called Visionable, whose chief exec uh, was very proud to receive a leadership award um, 
last night, and some of you are wondering, why is he calling himself Victor Adibuali when last night he went up and got an award as Alan Lowe? So for those people, I'm not Alan Lowe, right? He's six foot and Scottish. I'm six foot, well. So I have a particular perspective, and I've sat in the house, I spoke at the second reading of the Health and Social Care Bill, I watched the white paper on social care become formed. I have, I'm an ex-CEO of an organization that looked after 100,000 people, employed 5,000 of them in the social care space. So I'm just going to very quickly run through in the next seven minutes what I have observed, and then I'm going to leave you with a challenge um, because those of you that are pessimistic, if you're in this room, right, you're far too lucky to be pessimistic, right? Just far too lucky to be pessimistic. It's a luxury you can't afford. So the last two years, you all know, has seen an absolute explosion in the use of tech. In fact, I was told that um, we took on five years' worth of tech innovation in the first um, nine months of the pandemic. Right? So stuff that was being pushed before the pandemic suddenly became the rigor during, during it, largely thanks to some of the people in this room, I'm sure. All of it... Um, necessary. I saw video tech adopted by GPs who were terrified of video. I saw um, data and all kinds of packages being used. I also saw the choices um, being imposed on people against their better judgment with some un unintended consequences. So, for instance, I spoke to GPs whose video conferencing was actually costing more time because if you're in a poor area and you're in a video conference with someone who says, well, actually, you know, I've got a series of, of, of um, Ill illnesses, conditions, and one of them involves a pain in the stomach and the heart, you're going to say, well, you know, I need to see you. So you've spent 10 minutes on the video and then you call them in to do another 10 minutes when it had been quicker for them to just come in. <laughs> the law of unintended consequences. Prior to the pandemic, we had a number of technology implementation attempts in the NHS. I was there, I was like Zelig, MP Fit. Anybody remember that? Yeah, yeah, let's not go there. We saw Babylon. Babylon's running healthcare in Birmingham. Anybody have you got a Babylon account, any of you? No, no. We saw um, machine learning. Um, I did a piece with the BMJ on um, the rise of AI and the, frankly, frightening biases held within AI that we're currently using. I did a report with Lord James O'Shaughnessy and Imperial on that very subject. I've been to America, I've seen the future, 3D imaging of the inside of the body straight out of a science fiction film. Amazing stuff, absolutely amazing. I've seen social care tech at this exhibition, wonderful stuff. There is indeed a 10-point plan developed by Tech UK, um, developing world-class digital health and care standards, communicating the value of tech, international open standards first approach, centrally mandating key issues, assessing and embracing the use of interoperability, all that stuff. Support and integration of social care through digital transformation. Indeed, the social care white paper talks about digitization. I'm not quite sure what they mean, to be honest, but they do say it, so people will be talking about it. We are entering population health, integrated care systems, I could talk about that, but I won't because I don't have the time. In social housing, we have the introduction of web-based portals, the Internet of Things, housing associations using um, a whole range of interventions to understand their customers, but not necessarily connected to social care. We have a whole range of proactive, cloud-based, pandemic learnt, some of it useful, some of it useless. But what does all this add up to, really? 
What does it all mean? Right. I'm fond of saying the following things, and you don't have to agree with me, but I'll throw it out there. In the West, first world health systems are complex. Healthcare systems are complex. People get involved in the complexity. I like to get involved in simplification. So I'll tell you what are the three key challenges facing most health systems in the first world. Three of them. Equity, which is not the same as equality. Equity is about a woman in Barking and Dagenham with an active life expectancy of 55, right? She starts breaking down at the age of 55. A woman in Richmond-upon-Thames, which is the posh bit of London, really posh, active life expectancy of 70, right? That's not sustainable. It's not sustainable morally or economically, challenge one. Challenge two, access. Access is the means by which we design services, commission services, populate services with relevant staff. You can have equity, but if you don't have access, you've got a problem. And finally, digital. And the reason why it's in that order, because if digital doesn't help you with the first two, why are you using it? What's the point? Right? In my view, and it's just a view, the public sector suffered from a lack of confidence in defining its specifications. So we've been subject to the idea that moving fast and breaking things is what we need to do. I don't agree. That's a wonderful Californian phrase, relevant to California. What we need is fast evolution. To coin another phrase, we need to think long, which means we need a vision of where we're going to, and we need to learn real fast. Right? Learn short, think long. God, I've got a minute to get all this in. Our vision needs to be simple and clear. It needs to address the three digital domains, data management, devices, and AI. It needs to incorporate the need for infrastructure because you can have as much Internet of Things as you like. You can have as much data as you like. But if you don't have the infrastructure to manage it, and we don't, you don't get population health. You don't get interconnectivity. We should be able to question shibboleths in favor of flexibility. Interoperability is wonderful, but I can tell you now, most of the GPs that I talk to would swap, would swap interoperability with operability any day. 17 different codes to access different systems is not good. <laughs> is not good. So, we need a vision which actually responds to the reality of where we are. Demand will increase across all healthcare settings. We need to be clear about what the end point is. The golden fleece of all tech strategies, and you all are steeped in your Greek mythology, is achievable. We don't have a choice given the challenges that are facing the NHS and the care system. Workforce, demand, the elective care challenge. But the vision needs to be grounded in reality. And what is that reality for patients and clinicians? Let me tell you what it is in the final minute. It is the desire for positive value transfer. Do you know what positive value transfer is? Positive value transfer means that when you go to a service with a condition, doesn't matter who you are, you get as much as possible, you get everything that you need from one visit. Every time you're moved to somewhere else costs you time and the system money, right? 
Negative value transfer is when you are moved from pillar to post and post to pillar. By the way, if you're poor, that happens a lot. If you're middle class, not so much. Right? And if you're black and poor, it's real bad. Oh, by the way, I'm the exception that proves the rule. Take a look around this conference and think about who you are serving. This is Birmingham. Just saying. You've got five black people at a conference about technology-enabled care. I'm not saying that to say, make anybody feel guilty. I'm simply saying that as leaders, you have to lead everyone all the time, everywhere. You can't be calling yourself tech-enabled and only be leading some of the people somewhere, some of the time. Do you get my drift? Okay. So finally, the challenge is to create positive value transfer for everyone, to create population health, which has population technology, to have technology which is fundamentally about what humans do, which is humans first, that has an alignment between the vision of a healthcare system free at the point of access, the values needed to deliver that, a strategy which is clear and operable, and operations that are effective and can be executed. We, and I think I'm one of you, I might not be able to code, but I have a vested interest in your success. I'm one of you, I'm, I'm a co-founder of a digital company that's aligned to the NHS. I can't be more than you. So I'm saying this with a sense of urgency. Right? We cannot afford to fail. It's not, there isn't a plan B. Technology can't be set aside while we do other stuff. It has to be inclusive. We have to be honest about what we can't do and what we can. I think we need new entrants into the UK market that can deliver the kind of connectivity that we currently, frankly, don't have. We need to look at who we are and what drives our businesses and our companies, what values we have, and we need to deliver positive value transfer that reverses the inverse care law. And for those of you that don't know what the inverse care law is, it states that those people in, health, in need of health and social care the most tend to get it the least. And if we don't do that, the public will start to wonder why they're paying for a system that doesn't deliver to them. We don't have time, folks. We have to deliver it. You have to deliver it. We have to deliver it. If not now, then when? And if not you, then who? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Victor, and uh, for, for setting out those really crunchy issues for us. I'd like to invite to sit over there with us Helen Azam, or the social care lead for Microsoft, uh, Rachel Mason, expert by experience, and Steve Sadler who's a technology strategist with TSA. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Oh, do you want to go, David? You go there. So, um, the first thing I'm going to do is to invite uh, colleagues to my left, um, starting with probably starting with Rachel, to, to speak for two or three minutes around 
what this subject means to them in terms of the importance of it and the issues that arise for them. So if you want to just introduce yourself again, Rachel, and then, and then uh, go ahead with your okay. two to three minutes. Lovely. Thank you very much. Um, hello, everybody. Um, I'm Rachel Mason. I'm a family carer, two adult sons with autism and learning disabilities in their 30s now, having a really good life in their community. <coughs> and I can actually say with hand on heart, that's despite the way that throughout our family lives, through children's services, right through into adulthood, our data has been collected and uh, supported and how it's been dri driving the services that have been offered to us. If we were looking back into uh, transition, and the, I don't know if you've heard the, uh, the saying before about how many times uh, an individual or a family have to tell their story. It's that sort of thing, so the amount of meetings that we go to, whether that's through CAMS, whether that's the educational psychologists, whether it's with the schools, the pediatricians with health. Those notes, those meetings might have been written up and they're put on the individual systems, but actually when it comes to going to the, the next meeting or the next review, that common denominator to actually be able to, to uh, review to talk about what was at that last meeting, what the, the CAMS officer said, what the education officer said, what the school was saying, was myself. Because the, the way that things are sent, the way that, that people are recording, there, there is the, a, a lack of, um, I think you called it interoperability between no, systems. Right. Now, whether that's the education system, whether or not, again, we might have two, two care systems, like um, uh, Liquid Logic might have a, a, a different system for children's services and adult services. So when it came to my sons moving into adulthood and into adult services, it was very difficult for adult services and any uh, provision in adulthood to actually glean any information, some really rich information that was held on the other system. I mean, certainly around housing, uh, I could have told you when my, my sons were probably in their early teens what we would be looking for, what would be needed, where that would be. And yet, when we came through into adulthood um, and into adult services, adult services were totally unaware or hadn't asked, dare I say, here we go, asking the right questions. So lots of information is being gathered about our family, but nobody's asking the right questions, not those personal questions that would work for the outcomes that we're looking for. Now, I did mention that, that we'd actually got a really good life despite um, data, and I refer to that simply because we opted out of services because how the data had been collected, how the, the choices of what was going to be commissioned for people with autism and learning disabilities in our local authority didn't actually meet our outcomes. It would have met my son's needs. He would have gone into residential care, which was what was offered to us, but actually it didn't meet our outcomes. So we, we opted out and took a direct payment. But then we had, what were the opportunities that were in the community? There was no data available for us to actually um, be proactive with, with doing that. And so what I would say and what I'd like to be able to get from uh, the, the conference and what I'm very, very passionate about is how can we start not just gathering data about our needs, but data about our outcomes, work and co-produce with uh, individuals and individuals within a community so that communities can hold their data. If you've got um, information about um, uh, um, obesity or, or, or access to amenities and those sort of things. Work with a community, don't put a service around it, but actually give the, the data that you collect, give it back to the people, give it back so that we can take that responsibility, ownership, and, and keep ownership of, of um, our health and care. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you very much. The ripple of applause. <laughs> uh, that's great. Uh, and I'm going to move to Steve next because Thank you, David. you're next on the, te on the social. <laughs> um, so, so my name is Steve Sadler. I, I lead on technology for TSA. Uh, and I guess m my interest in all this is trying to help unpack some of these statements. Uh, so believe it or not, I, I even have a problem with terminology like technology-enabled care. Uh, and even data-driven services. That I, I, should, I should explain that, I guess. Uh, to me, technology can so often be um, interpreted as 
the next shiny gizmo or collection of them. We, we've all seen that, that problem. And I, I don't mean to decry some wonderful standalone assisted technologies out there. There are some fabulous examples. But I guess at this conference, we're, we're focusing on the stuff that's not standalone, the stuff that is helping to create remote connectivity to the people in the community and, su and support those people. So that, to me, means you don't really solve that by focusing on, on the gadget. Um, you, you don't even really focus on solving that by, by grabbing the data, believe it or not, despite this discussion. To, to me, the, the important part of the puzzle is information that you can act upon. So a lot of my time is spent on trying to unpick that. So I've been to the dark side, I've been under the bonnet, worked in product development, been a CTO for many years, and uh, was rescued by TSA to talk about <laughs> saner things. So I see my job is trying to, uh, trying to help understand how you can use technology and gizmos to gather pieces of data, but having gathered it, you need to do things with it. You need to clean it, process it, analyze it, make sense of it, and turn it into information. Uh, and even that information, you probably want to combine with other information and share it with other people to make sense of a, of a real scenario for a person. And until you've done that, you're really not informing a, a service. So just to give a, a couple of practical examples, the, uh, if, if, if we say we've got a wonderful whatever, motion sensor, you know, that will tell you whether we've just seen something or someone move in a property. Fantastic. For actually probably what you do need really is a, uh, a sequence of movement over the course of a day and how does that compare with yesterday and does it tell you something about uh, the change of gait uh, of that person's walking. So you're looking for behavioural insight and there are people out there who are doing exactly that with the technology we see today. But actually let's be smarter still, you know, thinking about the integration of different services. If you can identify, identify that a declining gait and a problem coincides with, let's say, a, a change of medication or a, an exit from an acute hospital episode, it's probably telling you something pretty informative about the, uh, the, the, the risks and stresses facing that, that individual. So to me, this is all about Yes, use the technology and, and maybe use the te technology to drive the data, but ultimately we want information that we can act on to, to deliver. Maybe one last point to, to leave the, the intro on. Uh, there's kind of an inverse problem that goes with this for me. Um, very often I've seen people look for gadgets as a, a magical solution. And there are some out there, by the way. I'm not, I'm not decrying that either. There are some great standalone pieces that solve problems, but actually in most cases, uh, that's not what we're dealing with here. We are dealing with those uh, items that deliver information. So I then find it very strange that people seek uh, continual delivery of evidence that these pieces of technology work in some way. Actually, it ought, it ought to be blatantly obvious that if we are trying to remotely support people to keep living in the community, we need to remotely access information about them so it's an informed service. So you get some very strange behaviours that emerge from this. Unless you get your uh, decisions right around the language, the semantics of that whole technology data information, uh, it, it, it kind of doesn't work. So I spend my life trying to help pick, pick our way through that puzzle. And at each of, each of those steps, there are, of course, complexities. There are standards that are needed, there are technologies that are needed. So trying to make that happen in the background, rather than what I've seen a, a lot of at this conference is too many of you delivering services are drawn into solving some of those difficult debates. I'd like to think that uh, myself and the team at TSA are trying to, behind the scenes, solve some of that for you. So that, that's, that's my role and my interest. Thank you very much, Steve. Uh, very, very interesting. And we've got two slightly contrasting presentations there about what it means to Rachel as a carer and in terms of an expert by experience in the issues and also from you about how do, we might, how do we make all this, this work from the um, from point of view of the elements and what we need to focus on? So last but not by no means least is Helena, but I do want to just encourage you to think about what questions you might want to ask the panel, uh, because after Helena, we'll be opening up for questions. So. Hello, lovely. Thank Thanks very much, David. So um, it's really lovely to meet you all today. Uh, my name is Helen Azam. I'm the social care lead at Microsoft. And my role really is to understand what's coming down the technology innovation pipe and how that might be applied across adult services, children's services, and also within the realm of integrated health and care services. Um, so, you know, for me, the, the data question, I think, is absolutely at the heart of how we're thinking about recrafting those, those services as we move forward. And I think 
um, you know, to, to pick up what Rachel said about, uh, you know, about outcomes, I think um, the common outcomes that I see in terms of the sort of service we'd like to deliver is one that is truly personalized, so very much respects particular circumstances that surround an individual, you know, where they fit within the community, which community groups they're part of, and I hope if we get personalization right, then perhaps we'll be able to address some of the issues that Victor raised in his uh, very compelling introductory speech around equity. The, the next piece, of course, is how we can use data to really get into the kind of early intervention and proactive, uh, proactive stance. And I honestly, I don't think we can deliver personalization or prevention without getting our data act together. What concerns me, honestly, about um, you know, our, the, the current shape of our market, particularly our technology-enabled care market, is that we are either delivering or procuring, in many instances, data silos. And I don't think that that's the way forward, because as Steve has just been explaining, um, if you look at one data source in isolation and you don't look at that data within a broader context of things that's relevant for an individual, then you're only seeing half of actually what's going on, and probably not even half. So I think that we need to work towards um, a, a world where you know, we are members of a data ecosystem, um, where from a practitioner, from a carer, from a clinical standpoint, we're not just interested in an integrated health and care record, which is all super duper um, and presents a chronological picture, but something which is much rounder. And it, it's occurred to me, we've seen rainbows, all sorts of kind of round things. We need a round data ecosystem that surrounds the person, that brings together information from what the f magic gadgets are saying, that brings together information from individuals and their family and friends and carers saying, well, actually, you know, mum's a bit, mum's a bit iffy today, I'm a bit worried about her, that brings information in from housing, whether that's smart homes or their particular housing circumstance, and then a single view across that data. So in, in layman's terms, I want a bucket to put the data in. It needs to be a bucket that is available at a place-based level. And then what we need is to use tools like AI, which uh, people may have heard me mention in the past, I often like to refer to in this market as assistive intelligence rather than artificial intelligence, it should be assisting us with all of this data we've got, to apply a sieve and help us understand who really needs help and support at a particular given time. So that's what I think about data. That's great. So actually, that the, the, the ecosystem um, around data and uh, all of those interventions um, paints a picture that I can certainly get a hold of. Right, well, I'm now going to stand up because I've got to conduct the uh, rest of it from over here. So it's easier to talk to you and talk to the panel at the same time. So we have a, a question from the audience. Uh, Daniel Casson, could you put the lights up, please, so that I can, brilliant, so I can see people. Daniel Casson. Uh, if you could put them. We've got some people with... Daniel, are you there? Yep, thank you. There's a microphone coming. <coughs> thank you very much, Victor. I'm Daniel Hassan from uh, Care England and from Digital Social Care. Uh, dear Sir Victor, I believe he's... Is okay? Uh, he's a lord, Victor. actually. But lord. <laughs> Victor will do nicely, I'll <laughs> <laughs> uh, dear, uh, dear Victor, um, I was, thank you for a fantastic and inspirational speech, and this also goes to, to, uh, to Rachel, to Helen and Steve. Um, one of the issues is that we in social care tend to be inside our bubble a lot of the time, with new ideas not coming in. Um, are there any areas that we should look to for inspiration for ideas, uh, you think that we can take on board? I do have some ideas, but I want to bring it out from, from you and from the panel, that how we can, how we can revol continue to revolutionise social care. Okay, who'd like, would you like to pick up on that, Victor? Um, so a couple of things. First of all, I'm, I'm with you, Rachel. I'm with you. I think that um, fundamentally, technology should increase the value of human relations, full stop, period. I think your sons should be able to speak to their team whenever they want, and on the same screen, they should be able to get the data about their lives in the language they understand. That's perfectly possible. I know that because that's what Visionable does. <laughs> but I think that ultimately, that's what you should be getting. Um, but to your question, the thing about social care that I find frustrating 
as the chair of the NHS Confed, and it's something I intend to do something about, is you're not really going to get... We have an either-or technology position at the moment. We have social care technology, we have health technology. If you want to be um, excited, the two things have to be brought together with the patient in the middle. So one of the things I'm talking to my Confed colleagues about is how we do that with you. Um, because the danger is that you're going to have technology that's about social care and technology is about health. The patient doesn't give a damn. Mm -hmm. The patient just wants information that enables their lives to be better. Full stop, period. Um, so I'm inspired by people who can do the and and, not the either or. I suspect you are as well. So I would suggest that you talk to Matthew Taylor at the Confed. I think that the, the one thing I was going to say, I'll say this very quickly if yeah, I may, sure. is that what, what I mean by the public sector's lack of confidence in writing specifications for technology companies is that we don't say to them, look, if you want to work with us, you have to be able to demonstrate how your technology brings together health and social care, puts the patient citizen at the centre and can do so with added value. If you can't do that, let's have a chat. We'll be nice to you, but you haven't got much business here. And we, we've been a bit shy about defining that specification. I'm hoping that bringing together um, uh, NHSX Digital under uh, Tim Ferriss might create that kind of impetus, but I'm personally behind that because we're in danger of being the victims of our own lack of confidence. Thank you, Victor. So, um, Helen and Steve in particular, so from your knowledge, given the point that Daniel's making is, are there any other sectors or areas we can draw inspiration from? Do you think there is? Or Banking, not? sorry. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Just say. Well, well, Daniel and I did have a chat over this just prior to lunch, so I should probably steal his thunder. I think he's got some really interesting ideas about actually how we can use um, some technology that's deployed in other highly regulated industries. So, you know, banking and finance in terms of empowering people to have access to information to make sure it's shared appropriately and stuff. So I definitely think there's something there. Um, I think more excitingly, honestly, is if we look to the world of gamification, the impending metaverse when that arrives, and the opportunity that that presents people, perhaps people like Rachel's sons, to interact, to be socially independent, using a means that, you know, is their kind of daily bread because you know most most of these folks are very very keen on gamification and you know playing games and all of that sort of thing and there's a means of you know social connectedness there but there's also um, you know I think quite interesting opportunities to use that sort of capability in fact it is already being used for physio and other things so helping us do the things we all know we should do um, in terms of leading leading healthier lives so those are just two examples from me but Steve I don't know Maybe just to add, to add one further aspect to this, uh, rather looking somewhere else, I mean, just a different point in time, um, COVID-19 inevitably impacted us greatly. And certainly what the TSA, TSA team saw over the last two years was quite, quite a significant change in terms of people trying to adopt technologies in new ways to link to their family members in innovative ways, using new open technologies, grabbing data in different ways. So I'm quite enthused that there's, there's a real groundswell to change some of this and, and try and, and, and there was an awful lot of that revolving around, you, you, you said almost like a consumer driven piece to this. So it was very much focused on the end user and their family rather than a, a prescribed service model. So I, I'm, I'm really enthused by that aspect of it. The okay. only thing I would say, if I may, is, um, and this isn't, we work, one of your people as, as on Visionable's board, a oh, okay. uh, chap called Jeanette, is, is your chief health person or does advise you on health. The only thing I would say is this about technology that involves this is a 650 pound phone. Yeah. I'm very lucky I can afford one. A lot of people aren't that lucky. Yeah. So that's what I mean by technology needs to deal with the equity and access problem. Mm. And if it requires you to own stuff, that's a problem. So. It is, po it is, in some communities, it would be cheaper to give everyone one okay. of these. Yeah. 
but you have to do you have to be able to do that what you can't do is say you can do all this stuff including meta but you need a 600 pound pair of glasses a 600 pound phone access to the internet mm. yeah yeah I, th I think some local authorities are starting to look into that though aren't they in order to you know tackle some of those issues that's true yeah. but they have to be able to it's the and and thing again what worries me slightly and it's only slightly at the moment is technology seen as a replacement rather than an, uh, an enhancement so you, you some te some local authorities are really smart and are doing that in a really um, human way others are kind of less sophisticated so you might get your phone but you but you don't get the enhanced relationship that it should provide you with which is your point really yeah. it, sh it should enhance the relationship it should increase value and if I, sorry, if I, if I may, I'm, I'm going to put it in. Yeah, go for it, um, go for it, Rachel. But, but one thing that I really want to emphasise to, to everyone, and, and as you say, what are the ideas for, for social care? I would say the best people that know what tech would work for them are the end users themselves. We most likely are the people, if we can help co-produce a piece of tech come to us at the very first point of when you're thinking about designing something, go and source from an end user's point of view, what is it, what are the, what are the barriers, what are the benefits of having something like this? But also when, when you said the, the, the benefits, any ideas for, for social care, and we're talking about social care and health tech, I'd say the majority of the tech that my son has used to reduce his budget from 42,000 down to 9,000 pounds a year is all what I call innovative use of digital gadgets, but they're not linked to social care. They're linked to your Alexas, they're linked to you know, eBay and um, a, a men's gadget sites, you know, things that are, but what I've done is repurpose them to actually give it, a, 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 the, pr provides the outcome for us. So, so I'd be inclined to say that, that let's try and, and get that interoperability that we were talking about now. Don't build necessarily for health and social care. Build the tech to give people good life outcomes like totally everybody agree. else has got. Because that tech might actually be picked up by everybody else. Yeah. Yeah. There's you your market as well. Don't you have to yeah. make your market small for people that are using health and social care. There's yeah. a much wider market out yeah. there if you're looking at, at that. Very, very much. Thank really, you for getting really, us. Really thank that. you for getting us go, going, Daniel. So I've got a question for Rachel now. Um, what do you want to see from the data shared, and how could this best support you as a carer? Okay. So, so I think building on what I I, I said earlier, um, the. <laughs> We're going back kind of pre-COVID, and we're talking about um, just after the, the Care Act came out in 2014, and there was an also a, a push from the NHS, and it was a five-year plan back then. But, but I was working with, with colleagues in um, uh, the, the Somerset CG, CCG at the time when they were trying to promote more self-awareness, more self-ownership of your health and well-being, and social care were trying to encourage people to look for more community options and more uh, communities to be more self-sufficient. But I'm coming back to, to the same things, the same priorities, that the, the data that seems to be gathered, whether it's through the, um, the assistive technologies that we're introducing into our residential care homes, our supported living homes, our day services, and, and any other health and social care services around us, and then that is put into um, strategic planning, it's put into financial management of the, the big social care, spending of the social care um, funding pot or the, the, the health pot, um, and it's there to kind of promote the, um, uh, the prevention agenda by embedding a prevention agenda in the way that we commission our frontline services. But what we don't do with that same data that we gather is give it back to people, to give it back to, to people to take ownership and find their own solutions, to take it back <coughs> to communities to be able to identify um, their own solutions because if we can do that before we even come and knock on the door of adult social care then I think that is prevention in itself. Thank mm. you. 
I've got a couple of questions now that are pretty similar and quite popular, so I'll ask them together. Uh, what, an anonymous person says, I love Helen's idea of the individual having control of their data from all different sources, but how can we achieve this? Mm. And the other question is, is, how can we support individuals using consumer technology to use the data held within their own purchase solutions to educate and shape their own care? There's, there's, a, there's a, a theme there about the, the, the citizen being in control of their own data and utilising mm -hmm. it in the context of an internet of things, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, who would like to have a go at that? Well, that, that is around self-direction, isn't it? Yes. Choice and control, self-direction. Yes. And again, there are many vehicles that you can do that, that with. So you can, you can go the whole hog and, and take a, a direct payment, a personal health budget, an individual service fund. So the, the, the Care Act gives us the, the, the vehicles, gives, gives individuals the vehicles in, in which to actually co-produce. Just because you take those options doesn't mean that you're, again, opting out of services and moving away. But often when you do take that services step back and focus on, on what they're commissioning and you, and you kind of set afloat a little bit, but again, we're back to the, the, the sharing of, of the data, being able to, something as simple as good stories. So many people over the years have probably heard my story of, of moving away from residential care, going over into his own home, using tech. People are very inspired when they hear that story. But I could say a handful of families that would really be inspired and energized by my story ever get to hear it because they don't come to these conferences. There is no, um, um, what would you call them, peer support networks that are funded to be able to support a mother talking to a mother or, or f to, to look at there are different ways than the traditional, often um, very overbearing services that are traditionally commissioned. There are different ways of doing it, but how yeah. do we get that story out there? Yeah. Sure. So, Victor, you want to come well, in and yeah, I'm going to bring a, Helen well, and Stephen. Just a couple of things. First of all, I agree with everything that Rachel said. There's a couple of things. One, I think we should start using the word stories. I think people need to own their own stories. Mm -hmm. Because data is really, it's about information, as has been pointed out. People need to own it. But there is a, quite a, I've been involved in a number of attempts to um, engage the population at large with data. Most of them have failed um, because there's a growing mistrust between the individual and the state. And that's a problem. Uh, the work of Axel, Dr. Axel Heitmuller in London has done some work on actually moving that forward. But ultimately, there's a couple of things. First of all, I think it's part of that confident narrative with technology companies. Part of the specification should be that we want you to be enable, part of the enabler for people to own their own stories, not least because those stories are increasingly valuable. As you know, data is more expensive than oil, and he's, it, we've got some of the most, ex most valuable health data in the world. So there's something about actually a really sophisticated relationship with a patient citizen should be honest about the value of their own story mm -hmm. to them and to everyone else. Two, I think we need to understand the, the, the NHS and the healthcare system values qualitative, uh, quantitative data rather, over qualitative data, right? But actually, in a, health, in a people's focused service, qualitative data matters. Mm -hmm as much, sure. if yeah. not more, and we need to gather that as well. Um, and the final thing I'd say is that we are, we are some of the simplest technologies um, are capable of having the greatest impact. So I think things, we haven't finished, and I would say this wouldn't have, but we really haven't finished on the journey to the effective use of video technology. We, we just haven't finished that journey by any means. And I think during the pandemic, we just need to, we need an opportunity to reflect on what we actually learned during that period, because not all of it's good. No. <laughs> not all of it's good. So I do think that we need to enable people to own their own story. We need to place, use the resources of some of the tech, well, all tech companies really, as part of their deal with the NHS and social care system to be part of that journey and to be part of the solution, not part of the problem. You know, and we need to learn from two years of hell in which 160,000 people died and we use some technology. We owe it to those people to learn. 
sure. about that and apply that into the future use of technology. Yeah. Thank you. Helen. I, I mean, I guess in terms of the how, I, I mean, I'm interested to see the evolution of the NHS app, which again, I think was a beneficiary from the pandemic in terms of the fact everybody all of a sudden wanted it because you wanted a COVID pass. Um, I'm not sure whether or not that is the right vehicle for that broader information set that we're talking about here, but I think certainly something along those lines that allows an individual to own their story. But I think really importantly, you don't just want a static story, you want a vehicle actually to be able to dictate your care experience on a given day. So, um, you know, if my alerts are going off, there's an issue with me, first port of call might normally be my husband, but if he happens to be in hospital, then I might want to say, well, no, don't bother him right now because he's, you know, he's not in a good place. I want you to call my sister instead. And so it needs to not only present a story to us, but it also needs to allow for us to then intervene in that story to dictate what actually would work for us on a given day or indeed for our representatives, um, you know, if we're not personally able to make that decision. So I, it, it has to be, it has to be two-way, whatever this thing is. I mean, maybe, maybe it's an app. Maybe we'll have something smarter than that in time. But I think that would probably be, be today's answer. So I don't know, a care app, maybe? Yeah, sure. Steve, yeah. any comments on this? Well, maybe just one observation. I think, I think we may be too frightened. I mean, my colleagues here describing this brave new world, which is fantastic. Self-directed, access to information, affordable technology and all the rest. When, when you wrap that up into a bundle, it, it kind of sounds a, a big challenge, a big change from where we've been. And that's as much to do with our history as anything else. We've been used to a constraint of the technologies, locked down by standards for all good reasons of legislation and so on. But actually most other sectors of society have grappled with this. We, you can access your shopping and your services in a multitude of ways quite, quite cheaply and include consumer technology. So, so I'm quite optimistic that that big elephant, which is that change, is manageable if you eat it in little chunks. Yeah. Uh, so, so what I mean by that is if, if, you, if we tackle these two uh, separate initiatives, you know, if we make sure we've got a shared language for our information and we embed that in a shared care record, if we then pursue initiatives which means that systems interoperate. You know, when, when Victor talked about 17 different logons for a GP, you can guarantee those systems didn't talk to each other either, or some of them wouldn't have done. But that's solvable. There are lots of other systems out there that interoperate and share data. Let, let's follow that initiative. And, and you can keep on eating the elephant in small chunks. And probably ultimately, the, the, the biggest challenge for me is I, I think we're trying to support people living at home. And actually, we're all different shapes and sizes, and our homes are different shapes and sizes. So ultimately, when we're trying to take information from that data, we need to be smart about that. The analytics need to recognize and base like that appropriately so you can use the, use the data. So I'm actually quite optimistic that we can eat this in, in separable chunks. And some of those are already programs of work that TSA is leading on. Some, some are not. They need kicking off. Sure. So it's good to leave this on, a, on, on an optimistic note. So we've come to the end of our allotted time for this particular thing. We have a once our panellists have, have left the stage, we've got another um, bit, so please sit while we um, change people around. But I just wanted to um, say that in terms of the summary of this afternoon, I think we've heard a rich array of presentations from the user care experience about how to make it real to better control, understand and to provide information which helps people to access the right care and support at the right time. We've had um, Victor's uh, exposition of the sorts of opportunities that exist, but some of the challenges about inverse care, um, inequalities, and how we address that whilst we are making sure that we're providing uh, the best services and the best responses to all our, our communities, and how that can be done. And obviously we've had um, experience from Steve and Helena of well, how might we make all this work? What are the opportunities? And giving us a little bit more detail about the, as Steve said at the end, the, the, the mood for optimism, the grounds for optimism. So, very grateful to our panel. Um, I will just take the Chair's prerogative of just answering a couple of quick questions that have been posed anonymously. Um, the, one, the first one is about, um, it says simply, how do we stop health and care uh, commissioners being risk averse and, and I think one of the ways I would say wouldn't I because I am chair of tech 
quality is to make sure that the services that are being offered are quality assured in terms of their safety and quality and cost effectiveness, which is where why TSA invented the quality service framework a few years ago and created tech quality. And, um, and the other point that's being made that I wanted to... Um, ha one one uh, commentator has said that it's very difficult with, with governance, data governance, to share information across organisations with strict GDR procedures and privacy concerns. Um, people are sceptical about data sharing. Well, I think in my initial introduction, I s described how in Nottinghamshire we set about sharing information across health and care and some of the wider health and care agencies for a population of a million people in Nottinghamshire. It took us a, few, a, a couple of years, and, but we did overcome the GDPR requirements and we made every GP practice signed up to asking their patients whether they minded their information being shared, which covered a lot of those permissions. So what I'm saying is, we did it, it can be done, and I think these are the sorts of barriers where we need to kind of overcome the myths. I'm not saying it's easy, but we need to overcome the myths and challenge ourselves to make progress. So, I think if I could invite you to uh, give our panellists a round of applause uh, whilst they leave the stage. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Right, I'd now like to invite uh, Alison Skirfield, Clinton Farkerson, and Jeremy Hughes uh, to join us on the stage um, to launch the Tech Action Alliance. So over to you, Alison. It's Clinton and... Yeah, they're coming. While we're waiting for Clinton to come in, I think um, we all need a challenge, and I think Lord Victor today has just inspired me um, to know what we need to do tomorrow, the next day, until we come back here in a year's time. If I reflect on yesterday as we started plenary, what we heard from our government colleagues was there's energy, enthusiasm, passion. And she described it, Michelle Dyson described it as uplifting. She came to this sector event and was uplifted by you um, and your passion and your energy to move things forward. We've seen collaboration is a key thing in partnerships. We've seen that on the innovation stage from our housing colleagues, from our health and social care, joining forces and actually delivering coordinated care. We've seen our NHS colleagues on main stage and on the plenary working together in communities as one, which is brilliant. And then we've seen Howes and Lynn today. This morning we heard from Clinton and what's really important to all of us when we call home. But Lord Victor's gave us the challenge. He said, lead, lead everywhere, lead everyone all of the time. That's what we need to do as a tech sector. We've got a voice now. We can go out there and lead, but we need the tools to be able to do it. And this really starts to say, how do we broaden our horizons as a tech sector? We need to start looking outside ourselves. If we really want to influence health, housing and social care, we need to partner with them. Now that brings me to what we're gonna to launch today. We've been doing a lot of work myself and Jeremy Hughes and Clinton to think about how do we look outside those sectors? How does TSA in the tech sector place themselves with other organizations, with world leaders to actually take us on a new journey and a new horizon? So over the coming week or the coming months, uh, we'll be starting to set up, and this is the official launch for what we're gonna call a technology enabled care alliance. You see what it's going to do. The key function is to bring partners and sectors to change, and, but more importantly, the word action and to do. We're going to be supporting and influencing government towards collaboration and action 
And once again, it's action. You've seen lots of action and of what we've been doing over the last two and a half years. And everyone is inspired and it's been really lovely to see what's been delivered and the change in some of our communities. But we have a long way to go. Getting the best results for tech. I think you've just heard on your panel that, you know, data, how we use data, how we use that intelligence in a meaningful way is something that we need to do. But we have to have shared learning and experience with our four nations. We heard from our Director General yesterday in Scotland, and we do a lot of work in Wales and Northern Ireland. We need to bring these governments together across the four nations, but we need to bring government departments together too. So this is our challenge, our Tech Alliance, and I'm really proud uh, and delighted to be co-chairing this Tech Alliance with Clinton. He's gonna really keep people at the heart and focus on people in communities. But here we are, Microsoft, Ver uh, Verizon, Taking Care, Le Grand Care, PA, Tunstall, Home Instead, Care Tech and Lilly. You'll notice these aren't the normal partners. Some of our existing partners are supporting us, but we've reached out to people that wouldn't normally work with TSA in the tech sector. So I'm absolutely delighted. I've got a challenge to lead everyone and everywhere through our Tech Alliance. So I'm gonna hand over now to Clinton, who'll talk through from a user perspective about people and how that's gonna be at the heart of everything we do. Thank you, Alison. Um, today, I'm here to talk to you about what real genuine co-production and technology as part of the Tech Alliance. I want to be involved, um, I wanted to be involved with this project to emphasize the fact that people with lived experience of drawing on care and support um, and should be in the dri uh, driving the future of technology in health and social care. We all want to live meaningful lives and it is my belief that technology should be an enabler of that. But the only way to ensure that we are in control is through genuine ongoing co-production. A lot of people can have fear of technology, of it being used to replace human contact and the human touch, but we know it can also be much more than that. I don't use my Alexa to replace my mum, but I might use it to call her. I believe that technology can transform care and support by taking on the menial task and thereby allowing more time for relationships, which to me is what good care and support is all about. To bring people along with the developments of tech and to ensure that the solutions meet the people's needs and get buy-in. We need to work together to ensure technology has focused on supporting people's dreams and aspirations to live a meaningful life. For me, this needs uh, the building of trust and genuine co-production between all parties involved, people with lived experience, researchers, companies, care and support professionals. Genuine co-production can only go at the speed of trust. Trust in each other, that our opinions are valued and listened to, the trust that we are experts, and the trust that we are all working towards a single goal. We are all human, and as such, we all have dreams, hopes, and aspirations, and needs, and wants. Co-production asks us to recognize that, and I think, importantly, the role of technology is that it supports us in being human. Our relationships, our lives, the things we aspire to do. For technology to work, people with lived uh, experience of care and support, we need to work alongside each other, not being driven by technology, but with us in the driving seat, developing technology that supports 
what is important to us. So co-production does not mean involving people at the end of an initiative or a project through user testing, but having people there shaping things from the start as equal partners. It means challenging stereotypes, for example, that older people are not interested in tech and working together to ensure that technology reduces rather than increases inequality. I ask all the partners here to commit that as part of the Tech Alliance to work in general co-production because only through that will we be able to find and build technology that will work to support a meaningful life. Thank you. So, thank you, Clinton. And just to add a few words about the importance of the Alliance and how pleased I am to be here helping get it started and making it effective. We've heard over the last couple of days a lot of talk about the phenomenal opportunity we have to make a difference, partly driven by the change in the attitude to technology as a result of the pandemic. But what do we do? We've been talking here for two days. Do we go back tomorrow to the pile of emails waiting for us and the meetings that have been postponed while we're here and just carry on with the day job as it was before? Or do we do something different? And the bid of the Action Alliance is to do something different. We need to seize this one-off opportunity because it won't come again. We need to raise awareness to a level that isn't there at the moment. Um, one of the founding partners, Taking Care, have just done a YouGov poll in the last two weeks. And although it's increased, it says that there is still 60% of the population who are unaware of the analog to digital switchover. Now, the avid readers of the Daily Mail in the room will know that today, um, British Telecom, according to the Daily Mail, have paused the rollout of the switchover from analog to digital. And they've said, according to the Daily Mail, because they know they've got some things wrong. Well, we've got an opportunity to get those things right and to increase public awareness, not just about countering the fears that people have, and we know that 60, 70% of people are afraid of what it could mean for their care support systems and their telephone systems in their home, but actually to realize the full potential of what could be brought about by effectively broadband going into everybody's house. So let's use that opportunity as one example of where we can increase awareness. But we also need to increase awareness amongst ourselves. In the NHSX, now di digital transformation uh, part of NHS England, they did a, a research last summer with Ipsos Mori, and they found that 48% of care providers don't think that they can recoup the cost of technology in the fees and in the financial uh, efficiency of the company. 42% think they can. So we've got a bizarre situation where roughly half of us think we can do it and half of us think we can't. So again, awareness and understanding needs to increase. Now, as Clinton says, this is about real empowerment and real engagement with people who live day by day, supported by the technology that we all believe in, we all develop. But it will only work if we change the dynamic of that relationship of partnership. One of the things that I've always found difficult in NHS is the expert patient program. Because by definition, the expert patients, when they become experts, no longer become, are no longer representative of everybody else. So we must continually reach out to new people, to more diverse communities, and engage them in genuine co-production, as Clinton said. And finally, we need to make sure that the Alliance brings together people who don't normally talk together. We want to reach out to more sectors than ever before. As Alison put up, we've got nine founding partners. We think we might increase that, increase that up to about 12 to 15, probably not more, because we don't want it to be too big, because it won't be effective. But for example, we want to bring in one of the big utility companies. We probably want to bring in one of the pharmaceutical companies, because they can see digital in relation to patient experience and patient support from their perspective. And one or two other sectors, probably financial services as well. So we, we want to make sure the net is as wide as possible. We also want to work very closely with government, and I had a very good discussion with Michelle Dyson, who welcomed the founding of the Action Alliance when we spoke yesterday. She can see that what we can do is help make sure that the government really can deliver on the potential in the social care white paper. 
But more importantly, we can work with other government departments. And as many of you know, government departments tend to work in, in silo. Um, last week, I met the Minister for Digital Tech and Economy in DCMS. He didn't really have much connection to what we're talking about from the care sector today. Uh, I've talked to people in Bayes. There are people in the Department of Transport. And of course, there's a digital section, a technology section, in the uh, levelling up white paper. We can help government by talking about all those together from the perspective of the individual who wants to be one person in one household with their family, with their community, in their home. So I please ask you, join with us in the Action Alliance and make sure that it has the emphasis on the penultimate word, action, because that way we will make the biggest difference. Thank you very much indeed, Alison, Jeremy and Clinton, for um, describing that important uh, and what I think is a very exciting initiative. Um, having worked locally, regionally and nationally for many years, what I know makes a difference is when groups of people come together in common cause in order to turn the dial. So I think there will be obviously more information coming forward about how people can get involved, but it strikes me as a very important and uh, vital development. So thank you very much, and thank you this afternoon for your attendance uh, in the auditorium, and I hope you've enjoyed the session, that you enjoy the rest of the day, and have a safe journey home at the end of the day. Thank you very much. <laughs>